So in honor of the 50th anniversary of the 1963 events, um, we have some former library employees. Would you guys mind introducing yourselves for anybody, please? You want me to start? Yes, sure, please. I'm Hope right. Cooper. Uh, I retired three years ago. I'm Barbara Sermons, retired in 2010. No. 2008. <laughs> 2008. Joseph Blair retired in 2004. George Stewart retired in 1997. Okay, and we're just going to have um, a few questions. Who are you? Oh, I'm sorry. And I'm Catherine Oseas. I'm an assistant archivist, still not retired. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we just have a few questions. I um, kind of want to get an idea of what the library was like and what it was like to be a librarian, um, you know, through the ages. Um, so, what was your first job at the library, and what was your first day like? So, you hope my first job used to be called a circulation clerk, which means I check books out, I check books in, and I issued memberships, and actually. My first day was George Stewart's birthday. It was August 19, 1968. And I had no idea that I was starting a career. Most people didn't know. I know, but I did not, you know, I, it was a job. Yeah. yeah. My first job was branch librarian at um, the ends, East Ends of the Branch. And it was very scary. Um, it's like, I didn't really know what I was, what was expected of me, and I didn't know what to expect of the job, and I too thought that I wanted to be here for a brief period because of my husband's job. This was just something to do while I was here. My first job here was in the field of service. I came in 1963, May 27th. I didn't know I was going to be this long. <laughs> and the thing about it, we had a, a man who looked beyond the cup. It was a fancy to get something. He said, you'll be here as long as I'm here. I looked at him and I said, something's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the greatest things was, I don't know how he did. He put me and Mr. Stewart together working yeah, at the yeah. Fair Park. Yeah. He lived in Central Park near the end. And we'd have to tell him what time we got to work or what time we left. <laughs> they left up to us to find that place. Oh. And we became good friends then, and we still friends. That's right. Mr. Thorne hired me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I missed Mr. Thorne, but <laughs> other than his ghost. His ghost. Uh, I missed the real Mr. Thorne. I started at age 16 uh, in the Central Park branch as a page. Of course, then, as now, people who work in the branch are sort of doing everything. Uh, but I was hired as a page. And I came downtown in 66, I think, and been here ever since. Okay, so you all started at varying levels of page, clerk, librarian. Where did you end up? What was your job title on the day you left? General Gopher. <laughs> um, I, my official title was Coordinator of Support Services, which meant pretty much anything that was not public service if it had to do with the maintenance of the buildings, the grounds, um, even to some extent communications. I worked with IT in that. I did not have much to do with books, which was a great surprise to me mm -hmm. when I started it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's what I ended up doing, and I loved it. It was fun. It was never boring. Crazy, often frustrating, but you never got bored, ever. You didn't like it really at first. No, when we when I moved you there. <laughs> well, Jack actually moved me there. Between the two of you, he moved me there. Um, but I, I think I, I think I did a pretty good job. You did. Of it. You did. You did. We knew that you were the right person for that job. That was the niche that needed to be filled. I um, ended up as director. I worked as branch librarian, coordinator, associate director, and director. And when Mr. Sue was talking about starting as a page, I actually came to the library with a card from the employment uh, center 
for the you know for the job as a page. Mm -hmm. And I uh, I had my master's when I came to Birmingham, but I wanted to get into the library system. So I convinced the lady at the employment office to give me a recommendation for the page job. And she said, they're not gonna hire us, but just give it to me. I'll go and I'll deal with it if I get it. And I met with Miss London and did my little application. And when she saw that I had a master's, she said, you wanna be a page? I said, well, not really, but you might need to get in the library and start someplace. And it just so happened that there was a branch position available at East Lindsay. And she went up to Jack and told him about me, and that's how I got into the branch position. So one amazing thing for me, in 1976, they said Mr. Slew was too young to run the bridge. They ran every time. They say too young. Them too, they too young to be running around the bridge. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I think it's just you both. We ran the bill, we got along. <laughs> I started as doing all the work, uncutting books, going to city hall, boarding kitchen, running all the way around, sometimes even driving a truck. Those days of time, it was no such thing as job description. Yeah. You fit in where you be. You did what needed to be done. You did what you did to make the place a better place. That was how I, that was how I started off that day. Right job. You let the whole thing. So you got the feeling you're just feeling. Yeah. And he was a good boy. He came in too young, Samson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was too young. Yeah. I was too young. They said he was too yeah. young. He was too young. He was too young to be here. He was too young. I was. I just didn't know it at the time. I also never planned to stay here. I, I was finishing my master's degree in history and planning to teach. And Mr. Thorne is struck, as he as several people have mentioned, and I was downtown working on my master's thesis one day. Uh, at that time, I was employed at Central Park, and Mr. Thornley just happened to wander through the department, and I firmly believe he just happened to wander through. And he asked what I was doing, and I told him I was working on my thesis, and asked me what I was going to do, and I told him I was going to teach. And he assured me that was a good thing to do. And he said, but in the meantime, there's a job in the Southern History Department, and I know that's your field. Would you like to take that temporarily? So I took it temporarily <laughs> uh, and stayed and became the director. Um, came to stop and stay to pray, as the saying goes. But uh, he, he was very good uh, at identifying people Putting them where they That's right. He was not the easiest person to work for. Uh, he had been a Marine drill sergeant and he still ran the library that way. And as Joe said, that the library at that time, like most places, we weren't really different, but there weren't firm job descriptions. In fact, there weren't pay scales. No. Uh, <laughs> and you just sort of did what you were told to do. And you work the hours you were told to work. <laughs> they were not at all standard like that. Work three Saturdays a month. Work three Saturdays a month, that's right. Yeah. Or Sunday. Mm -hmm. So if you left and came back, you got you came back at a higher rate of pay. Yeah. <laughs> if you stayed, you didn't get any raises. You never got it. <laughs> Learn that. Yeah. Yeah. So since we're talking about the 50th anniversary, um, can you guys share your memories of 1963, what the library was like if you were here um, before desegregation and how the change came about, how it, how it really was applied, I suppose. I was a freshman in college, and I was at college when the bombing occurred, and like most people was appalled. Um, when I came back to Birmingham and I came to work at the library, it was still desegregated. At least the public service staff was. We had African Americans working in support areas, but not out dealing with the public. And one of the things that occurred while I was still a circulation clerk was Holly Brown, who had been branch head at what was then the Southside branch and is now Tittisville branch was chosen by Mr. Thornley 
Do you agree? Ms. Ramsey? Okay, I'm sorry. Ms. Ramsey took to come downtown and Holly never met a stranger, was as pro professional as they come, and was a joy to work with. And she walked in, and you would have thought it was the most natural thing in the world. What and year was that? that was 70, 71, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, change came with great difficulty for Miss Ramsey. Uh -oh. uh, she had been here all of her career. She had been head of the children's department. She had been assistant director. But I think it's completely safe to say she never expected right. and never wanted to be the director. Uh, and she happened when Mr. Thorne had dropped dead. And she was appointed director, and it came at a time when there were a lot of things changing. And race was not the only one. It was how women dressed at work. Uh, and that was really, really harder for her to deal with than the racial thing. But uh, she and I discussed, and I had been named the, well, at that time it was called the Deputy Director, uh, which had also fallen unexpectedly in my lap when Mr. Thorne died. And I too never expected, never even thought about being the director. But uh, she and I talked about things that needed to occur. And I, one of the things that I mentioned was that I thought that we needed to immediately uh, integrate the staff. And as Hope had said, service was already integrated, uh, but the staff was not. And again, the library was not alone in this. You know, blacks could shop at Lovelands, but there would not be a black clerk who was waiting on you at Lovelands. So the jobs came much more slowly than than being able to use the services. And as Hope said, we, we came up with Holly because we were looking for someone who would not offend anybody unless they were just totally rushing and precious. And we knew that you couldn't deal with those people. And certainly there were those people in the public, there were those people on the staff. But other than those people that you just sort of have to write off, uh, as, as Hope said, Holly was perfect. She never met anybody she couldn't talk to. She was unalterably courteous, uh, neat, uh, business-like. And uh, I think she surprised even herself at how smooth it, it went. And she laid the groundwork for all the That uh, whole saying, <coughs> His pants out here. I think Hope was putting your pants out here. I was the first one to wear slacks. <laughs> and I the I said, I first female was, to wear slacks. I hope it lost her grand. <laughs> you come in the basement, see, I had all day. I put Hope in the basement. And I said, Hope, you ain't going to make it. No. <laughs> you can't make it with these pants. Really? I know, she cannot. We, we had, a, we had a, some sort of a statewide library meeting was held here. And it was cold, cold, cold outside. And librarians from around the state came in wearing pantsuits and boots, and this was just unheard of. And after they left, at that point I was president of the staff association, I think, and Miss Ramsey came down and she said, Do you think people would abuse it if we allowed women to wear pantsuits in the building? Oh, no. It'll be fine. <laughs> so we could wear a pantsuit. It had to be a suit. Mm -hmm. Had to have a jacket and pants that matched. Could be striped. Couldn't be plaid. Couldn't be print. Solid. So that little barrier got broken. Mm -hmm. I, of course, broke the rule very shortly. Yeah. There. <laughs> yeah, she broke the rule. Yes. Well, uh, oddly enough, I, I think... <laughs> This is so strange today, and the young people who are watching this, this is before you were born. Right. Uh, but Ms. Ramsey's real challenge was officially saying that women did not have to wear hose. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, she just really had a hard time admitting that women didn't have to wear hose. 
<laughs> she always wore seams. Yeah. And this generation has no clue what that is. What that, what that, that is. is. They came back. Yeah. yeah. Well, when when my wife, and I, this my wife and I would go to the library in evenings, and Nancy would always say, I can look around the room and pretty well tell who works for this room. Because they were always the most professionally dressed people there. Uh, I don't think anybody abused the freedoms to select what they wanted to wear. Uh, but that was a real fear. Yeah, it was. I came in 78, and most of this was done with it. Yeah. Pretty much. Now, one thing I remember when this round and this soul did jump, we had a sucker thing. <laughs> when Lucille was down there standing up, put her hand on Gibbs, she'd been walking the kids. She was the business manager, business manager. personnel manager. She was the manager. Yeah, she, managed. Uh, she handled all supplies. That's right. And when you walked in and said, Miss Sullivan, I need a pencil. She would ask you what you did with the last one she gave you. <laughs> but I, I, I didn't ask, answer you about 63. Um, I was in a branch at Central Park. But of course, there's been a lot that's gone on before 63. Of the change of government, uh, the park board closed all the park facilities before Congress was off. And I, I, I'm not sure the library board ever got credit for saying we're not going to do this. Right. They never closed the facility. Uh, but nevertheless, there was a huge fight about changing the city government, not so much with the citizens as much as the existing city government. And, and I remember distinctly being told by Ms. Stone, who was the, the wax librarian, that uh, they had been told downtown that Mr. Connor had better not see a city employee's name on the petition to change the city government. And that was a very real, one of the, just a casual warning, you better not be seen that way. <laughs> As everybody has pointed out, there was no job security at that time. You could be fired because somebody wanted to. But the day of the bombing was a Sunday, of course, and uh, Nancy and I, who were not married in 63, but we were about to get engaged, but we, we attended the same church, and it was announced in church, and I remember everybody just getting full of shock. Sure. And, and the first time that I ever remember that church announced they would not have an evening service that day. But I remember leaving there and everybody was absolutely scared. Blacks weren't the only race that was uncomfortable during this period. And it, it, whites were often as afraid of the Klan and the other fringe outfits as, as blacks were. But we really were concerned about what would happen that day because most people reasoned that, that there would be some type of retribution for that. And in fact, there was another killing that afternoon. Two boys, that's right. Uh, but I think everybody expected that something terrible was going to happen in a white community, which actually would have been completely logical. But uh, as far as the demonstrations before then, uh, I'm like a lot of people, I've, I've read a lot of the accounts uh, from blacks and whites of that period. And most people, unless they were active participants in what was going on, really didn't know a lot of what was going on. Because the local newspapers didn't give any space. Uh, the local television stations, which were limited as far as what they did on news anyway, uh, didn't give them any space. So if, if you saw, if I saw what was going on in downtown Birmingham, it was on national news broadcasts. Yeah. Um, but I think everybody knew pretty quickly that uh, things were pretty serious. Yeah. Living, living on the outside of Birmingham, I came here from, I'm from South Carolina. And my husband and I moved here from Georgia. 
when we found out that he, his company was transferring him here, it was the worst day of our lives. We did not want to come to Birmingham because of what we had seen in the national yeah. media. And I remember telling my grandmother that um, we, we, moved, we moved to Birmingham, and her expression was, oh, he's taking my child out of the world. Mm -hmm. That was how she understood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we only had a small slip of paper with the name of the company that my husband was going to Woolworth in, but in um, five months ago. And um, we didn't know anybody, did not want to come. And we were coming in from Columbus, Georgia, coming in on 280. And when we got to the area where um, Lloyd's, the Narrows, it used to be the Narrows where it got real good. Yeah. It was the most beautiful sight that I had ever seen, looking at the mountains. And because South Carolina is all flat. And looking, it was, we got here about sunset. And I fell in love with the place. Mm -hmm. Had not met anybody, but just yeah. fell in love with the place on that trip in. And um, we expected to be here for a short period of time. And stayed. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. Back when the, <coughs> the 63 in the library first came here, I knew it was a thought to tell the people in charge. Do not move no books before 4 o'clock. Because I'll give you some of that. They couldn't accept it first. He said, if you do that, you got to go out of my way. And whenever a man says stuff, he's going to keep me. He didn't care what color you were. I remember him telling me some other thing. He told me one day, called me off. 1966, we had a good I've never done church. I know the between right and wrong. But the right, right way and wrong was good enough. He told me to never forget that. He said, right way and right and wrong was that. And he was strict about what he did. <clears throat> he also gave me the key to the car to go to his apartment, how that is. Said some things to him. If he cared for you, he would extra mind. If he didn't like you, he let you know. Yeah. Well, you yeah. were black or white, but he didn't care. Like you said, that Marine was to him. Mm -hmm. He was a tough little Marine. Mm -hmm. And he didn't need no hurt. I'm done that. Everything in Carolina. He did everything. He came and made a difference in this business. Yeah. And we won a lot of awards for the person. Yeah. The library did. Yeah. For the whole city. We got some awards for that. Yeah. Look another way. You have to take like this now. When Stuart Young, it was a lot on his shoulders. He was a young man, people older than him, but they don't want to listen. But it's a to look and see some people that he has picked out. You will be here. I didn't think I would be here. <laughs> <laughs> Did he address what was going to happen with the desegregation of the library? He called us one day and he said it was going to be a peaceful move if he be here. It's going to be a peaceful move to all the rest around. Be a peaceful movie then. And he meant that. If you don't like his rule regulation, you had to come. And Miss Soul standing there said, Yes, that's what we mean. Yeah. <laughs> well, he let me, yeah, that's what we mean. It's going to be peaceful here. Yeah. One thing we, we have to talk about is the fact that even before the um, desegregation, there were libraries in communities for white right. folk. And there were libraries and communities for black folks. Mm -hmm. So the library already was already out there in the communities. And um, so library service was being provided, provided for everybody, mm -hmm. maybe not together. And so over the years, you know, that changed. But that was, you know, the library was already in a good position yeah. to reach out to the community. Mr. Because Thornley and uh, Dr. Carol Hayes, who is I think assistant superintendent maybe at the Birmingham Board of Education for a black school. And and through whatever circumstances, I don't know, but anyway, they were, were close friends. And uh, I remember Mr. Thornley telling me one time, in, in hindsight, the period in 62 and so on, that he had act, asked Dr. Hayes. Dr. Hayes, do you think it would be helpful if we built 
a central library in a town to collapse. And Dr. Hayes looked at Mr. Garner and said, Oh no, Mr. Garner, we already have one. We just haven't decided to use it yet. Oh, that's fabulous. And, <laughs> and he, he was brain salt went from there. <laughs> That was great. Yeah, that, that, that was fabulous. Well, when, when the library was uh, <laughs> integrated and just segregated, uh, and Joe said it was, it was very peaceful. Uh, Deanie Drew, who later became a long term board member, right. uh, she was the one who officially did it. And I, there was, in fact, a little article in the paper where they did it. They were, Crowds and demonstrations. She just came in. Got a library card. And, by uh, fact, when Mr. Thornley died, there was a letter to the editor from, I do not remember, uh, who said that one of the things he never got credit for, and he got credit for an awful lot as far as building the library and this, that, and that, but he never got credit for peaceably handling what virtually no other department of the city managed to do. Ms. Drew told me about that time and she said that you know Ms. Drew was fair skinned. Mm -hmm. So could probably get into a crowd and not be noticed right. as much as others. And so what she did originally was to come in to scope out Sub Rosa. <laughs> to scope out the exits. <laughs> Yeah. So that if she needed an exit, yeah. she knew where the exits were. <laughs> so, uh, I love good. That. I just that. She told me that. That's me. Yeah. All right. Um, you guys have spoken a lot about Mr. Thornley and Mrs. Lindsay. So, who is one staff member who had the greatest impact on your life and your career, and why? What did they do for you, and how did they influence you? Well, Mr. Thornley would be the one. Uh, he he accepted Miss Stone's recommendation I'd be hired as page. And the director hired everybody. I mean, you could bring a recommendation to her, but he's the one that did the hire. So I I give him credit for that. Uh I remember the scariest moment I ever had at the library. I, Nancy and I had decided in 63 that we were going to be married. And we were officially engaged in 63. And in plans for that, and trying to finish school, I needed a raise. So, I did, which for a page I thought was very brave. I dressed up in my best suit and I came downtown to see Mr. Thorne. And that happened the day that Birmingham had just faced a severe financial crisis. And the city had announced that they were cutting everyone's budget. So I walked into Mr. Thorne's office and told him why I came. That I, he thought I need, I knew I needed it. I thought I deserved a small raise. And he looked at me and said, Stuart, don't you read the damn newspaper? <laughs> well, the, the headlines in the, in the morning paper had been that. City of Birmingham was slashing all its budgets. So I meekly went out and went home. <laughs> but I got the raise. <laughs> and as I've already said, he is the one who offered me the job at Southern. Uh, after I got to Southern, I still planned to teach. And Opportunities opened, and he gave me opportunities. I think Joe has mentioned to do other things other than duties assigned. And shortly, I decided I really liked the job. I liked what I was doing. I liked the place. I liked the people. 
And just when Nancy and I thought our world was settling down, I finally finished my master's at uh, Sanford. And we started a family, and uh, we were about to get caught up on school bills. And Mr. Thorne said, you know, if you're going to stay here, you need an MLS degree. Well, there was not a graduate school of library service in Alabama at that time. Uh, the closest was at Florida and Emory and in Louisiana. And I went to Emory to meet the summers, summers. Mr. Thornley set aside my vacation. Uh, he told the board what was going on. They kept me on the payroll. And I went through Emory. Now, the, the shocking, one of the many things, the shocking things about his death was I was, I had gone to Emory that spring semester. I usually went during the summer, but I'd gone that spring. And I just driven from Birmingham to Emory on a Monday morning. And I had gotten to campus and I'd gone in and each student had a little kitchen hole where they had two messages and so on. So I walked by and uh, there was a yellow note. It said, call your wife immediately. Mr. Thorne has died of a heart attack. As we have said several times, there was no contracts, there was no formal understanding. I was going to school on his recommendation and his blessings and his money. And I still have another semester to go, so I did not know what in the world was going on. But, of course, it all worked out, but that, that was a severe shock in many ways other than just going to die. And this Randy was caught in the same. No, that's not good at all. And in case you, you don't know, Mr. Thornley dropped dead of a heart attack uh, at home on a Sunday. And uh, and I had seen him the day before on Saturday. I, I made it a point uh, when I could, which was usual. Mr. Thornley worked every Saturday uh, until Sundays. noon, until when he went to lunch with his friends. Uh, but I would come in and report to him. So, so I had seen him the day before on Saturday. And then to get the note that he had been dead was a real shock. I worked that Sunday, mm -hmm. and he was in the building that Sunday. Mm -hmm. Put that hat on that head and walked out the door and said, See you tomorrow. Yeah. Now, my father came here like Mr. Thunder did. I came on May 27, the truth for your head, and said, I'm so This is a good place, city, a good place. Well, they're doing their time, you look around for benefits. He said, You got to get benefits, everything. First, we didn't have a credit union first. He got that for all of us. He looked out for us. It's good, pushed it hard. Then I got here one day, he called me and said, We're going to have a talk about life. He would tell me about the place he's been in life. Then another person was really involved in my life here, was a new son. She showed me how to all the books and everything like that. Which now they just go all the way to this manual. Check in manual. Like you have to wear a reading book and listen to everything. Then I learned how to move a stack line. Then I'll make night. Show them how to move a whole stack without taking all the books. <laughs> <laughs> they will teach you. No air condition. You know, hot stack. No air condition away. And you learn those people that learn through different things. You see Miss Ham say the stuff you can sit that chair and point it to you. Go right there, you find that book. She knows just like that. For every book in the place. Mm -hmm. But Miss Summer, she was a kind of a small older lady, real quiet petite. If you want to learn how to do camera on all the books, do it. On the other end, Miss Mason, she was another chair. <laughs> and she kept on the good and lying of the park. She was strictly about the military. And most of those ladies had never been married. It was their husband, the other one. Their life. 
and drafts me around in the hotel. And the top floor, she was looking to see how hot it was So it was a little bit of 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 a little bit Jack was my immediate supervisor, but Mr. Stewart was my boss. And I respected him so much. And it was, I, I guess it was because of the way he carried himself and his mannerisms and how he spoke to you. But what I appreciated most about him is that he gave you direction and then he moved back and allowed you to move out. And he was not one to stand over you and say, do this, do that, you know. And he expected you to do whatever it was that he gave you. And so I never, ever wanted to disappoint him. And I can remember you one, did not. I, one time, Mr. Stewart, I, I, I did. You may not remember this. I remember it. And I, I felt like I disappointed you. Um, there had been an accident at the East Ensley branch. And this was when I was associate director. Yeah, yeah, you remember. And I had, had uh, whoever the, I guess it was Mr. Carroll then, to do a, a, an incident report. But I had failed. I was a new associate director, and I had not sent the incident report. I had not told Mr. Stewart about it. I had not sent it to the city. But, you know, I think yeah. it was, I, I guess you would have sent it to the city, but yeah. it was filed in my drawer. And this was a person who actually went to the city and complained about the call. And Mr. Stewart got the call and did not know anything about it. And I felt I had let, let him down. But I, I went to my drawer and I pulled the file and I pulled out and I said, here it is. And, and he didn't fuss or anything, but it was just, and I felt like I had let you down that day. And, and I said, I never would do that again. You know, as a new, you know, and I, I always felt that the director needed to know what was going on, so the director could never be caught in a position like that. And so that was one of the things that I told all of us. us. <laughs> yeah, never let me be caught not knowing what's going on. You know, at least mention it to me so that I could speak about it like I know it, whether I know all of it or not. But that was the only time. But he, um, another incident was. Um, I was branch manager at um, Smithfield, and we were doing the building program. And the architect wanted to do something that I thought was really strange. He wanted to put ceramic tile on the tops of the counters in the workroom because it was a fashionable thing to do at that time. And I thought, this is ridiculous. you know. But I didn't have the authority, I thought, to tell him not to do it. But I told him, I said, you know, when, when you're writing back here, if I'm writing on a card, then, the, you know, it's going to cause problems if it won't be smooth. So, oh, but this is the right thing to do. So I came down, I told Mr. Stewart, and I, I told him what he wanted to do. He said, tell him to change. Simply as that. Tell him back. I, he didn't say you have the authority. He just said, tell him to change it. But to me, that gave me the authority to act. And I went back and I acted with that authority. And I said, this has to be changed. And by the way, I've already checked with Mr. Stewart. I learned a lot from him. Thank you. You're a good teacher, William. You were, you know, yeah, you were a well. very good right. teacher. <laughs> you were. Um, George is obvious. I, I'm sorry. We've known one another long enough. He has always been George. And I got into a great right. deal of Joe trouble. knows me as Pete. Pete so. Yeah. <laughs> and I yeah. only could call him Mr. Stewart. I mean, although he's I tried to be calm down, I couldn't. I, I can't. I, I got in trouble with a previous supervisor at one point because I called George George. Mr. Stewart, I said, he may be to you, but he George to me. <laughs> um, George hired me the first, no, Fan Thornley hired me the first time. George hired me the second time because I left. I just, I too decided I like this place and that I like the profession of librarianship. And so I trundled off to graduate school and commuted to Tuscaloosa every day, 150 miles round trip. Um, that was, gas was a whole lot cheaper then. Yeah. Um, and 
I came back here in 1978, and again, no real job description. I had written Mr. Stewart a letter and said, no, I'm getting bored with where I am now, because there was a period of time where I worked elsewhere and I acquired a husband, which was not a bad thing. And I said, if I'm ever going to use this degree, I, I need to do it now. And do you have anything you might be willing to hire me to do? And I don't remember if you called or wrote, but he said yes. <laughs> and I came in to talk to him and to Northley and to Jack, I guess, all sort of at, at one time. And they put me, for good or for ill, in charge of installing the first automated circulation system that we used. And those were the days. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's when I really started crawling around on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we started it when we were still in the other building and we made the plans for this building. And like with you, Barbara, the staff was given a tremendous amount of freedom to make their wants and wishes known with the design of this building. And I think it has functioned as well as it has for as long as it has because of that. You know, we would see something and say, uh -huh. and after a while, the architects learned that if that was what we said, that's what they needed to do. And I guess the next person would be Northleaf. I can't really talk about mm -hmm. my career in this place without talking about her. She was also ex-military. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And she became my supervisor. I can't remember exactly. I, was it right away? I don't even remember now because stuff gets yeah. run together. Um, I'm but not sure because we were reorganized. With everything, yeah, yeah. You just sort of answered to whoever told you to do something. But um, we never had automation to deal with. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. prior to this, when you say you were automated, you got an electric typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and the sole reason I think I got the, that responsibility was because I, in one of my previous lives, I had worked as a programmer, mm -hmm. and so I at least had a nodding acquaintance with the terminology. It was long enough ago that it isn't used anymore. You know, it was it was basic programming, mm -hmm. but it was fun. It was exciting. Northlake was also very much. She was extremely meticulous. Yeah. She was extremely fair, extremely objective, and she was somebody else you did not want to disappoint sure. at all ever. And um, she would give you an order, a suggestion, whatever, and then turn you loose to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that we sort of laughed about was, I'm not really that organized. I'm logical, but I'm not real organized. And my office is a mess, always was. Yes. <laughs> but I could find anything. Somebody yes. said, yeah. I need this. I'd say, okay, and I'd go get it. And Northfleet told me her office was always absolutely organized. And she could never find anything. Yeah. And so, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, it, very good mentors the whole way along. This has been a big family mm -hmm. um, in a lot of ways. And I don't regret a minute of it. Yeah. I do not regret a minute of it. You know, one thing we've not talked about, uh, it, it was one thing to, to get a job somewhere, but it's completely another to be able to go somewhere and get that job. Right. And I remember shortly after I became director, I, I, I noticed the, the rest of the staff, and I began to understand why nobody else wanted the job as the director. Uh, none of the department heads. They were all going to retire shortly. And nothing was automated. Of course, you didn't have personnel records. You could say, do this and do that. So I, I made myself a spreadsheet. Uh, I think I had, a, I've forgotten the first brand of what we call a PC now, but it was 
something like that. But I had a program. Six. I had a program <laughs> what it called multi plan, which was sort of like Excel is today. And I put in all the branch heads and the central department heads and their age and how many years they had been here. And I, I did a little plotting and I realized that within five years, none of those people were going to be here. Uh, and I, one of the things I was early convinced about as director, and I have continued to think this is a priority with any leader, is making sure you've got a next generation of leaders coming. And I remember sending a, a memo out to the staff and just saying that without naming names, that we're going to have a huge list of opportunities. It's going to be a huge turnover. And you need to begin preparing yourself if you have any interest in applying to these jobs. And shortly after that, Northley Jack and I jointly convinced the board. And again, we're not tied to any personnel managers, I mean, manual or assistant. But we convinced the board that as of, I've forgotten the date, all departments and branch heads needed to have an MLS degree. Well, I think at that time we had maybe what was one, two, three, head of tech, head of, tech, head of reference, head of cataloging, uh, head of circulation. Adele had one. Adele had one. You know, half a dozen MLS degrees in the entire system. But Alabama had opened its graduate school. So we started putting together grant money and state aid money and we we offered the staff, if you'll go back to school and work on your MLS, we'll give you the time and we'll pay for it. And they said a large number of people took us up on it. Uh, a lot of people I expected to did not. But most of our department heads in the next five years, ten years, certainly came out of that group that decided they would go back to school. Um, and, and, and again, uh, it was obvious at this time that that had no racial implications at all. If you, if the university, if you pass the university entrance exam, that's all that's required. Of course, you have graduated. Uh, but I, we had a uh, a official policy long before the court mandated that the city or the county uh, have a policy to to encourage uh, racial diversity on the job or, or advancement and so on. Uh, and, and quite frankly, when the city got one years later, uh, and they included the library in that plan, even though we were not under civil service, I went to see Mayor Arrington and I, I explained to him that I didn't think we needed to be included in that same pot because we had, for years, had a policy of doing that. And Mayor Arrington and I got along great. We always did. We never had a crossword. The man never asked me to do anything that was not proper to do. You know, we had some disagreements over things, particularly buildings and architects and so on. But uh, he, he smiled. He had a very nice smile. And uh, said without saying so that we need some agencies to bring up our average. And uh, <laughs> I can deal with that. <laughs> so from then on, I filled out my little quarterly report that we have three of these positions. And our long-term goal was to have one and a half of them white, one and a half of them black. No, not quite. <laughs> but but I, was, I was very proud of how our staff uh, picked up and yeah. stayed well ahead of everybody else. I'm always ahead. Of the city, we've always been ahead of the curve. Oh, yeah, yeah, way, way ahead. Yeah, 
in everything. Technology and everything. Everything. Yeah. So well, that brings us to my last question. Okay. Um, you've all seen libraries, not just ours, but the field change in terms of technology. How how do you feel about that? What have you seen change? How does it affect the way libraries function and how our patrons access and use our materials? Mm -hmm. In your mind, do you think it's better? Do you think it's changed the way librarians interact with their patrons? I need to brag on Marva for right now because it was during her directorship that this huge thing started right. to happen. And again, we were ahead of the curve. And part of the reason we were ahead of the curve was Barbara said, we need to be ahead of the curve. Yeah. And I'm setting aside these people, giving them extra work with no extra pay, ladies, yeah. <laughs> to do this. And she started something called the L2 group. And we've sort of gone from there yeah. because of her leadership. And that's by Melinda. Right, that's by Melinda. Yeah. I remember Melinda, Melinda, behind the camera well, in case well, you folks don't know. Well, Melinda had been asking me for us to get on my space. space. My space. Mm -hmm. And she had asked me probably about three times. Not really asked me, she would bring me little things, little snippets, and you know, this is what others are doing. This sort of annoy you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And um and I think we were having a branch meeting or something at Avondale. I think it was at Avondale. I don't know whether Melinda was there, but I decided at that moment that we were going to get a MySpace page, which was our first venture. We'd done other things, but that was really pushing us out of there. And Melinda got us our first MySpace page. And then, it, you know, from there it just went on. And, and we realized that we needed someone to manage this. Mm -hmm. And the only way we could manage it was to have people working with her. But we didn't have, there wasn't a department. They just had to, you know, yeah. Department heads had to give up a person with some hours to work with Melinda to do this. And that's one of the things that I'm real proud of. I just mentioned that. You did good. <laughs> yeah. But I think that that technology has forced libraries to change. And had it not been for technology, we our profession may not be, might not have been where it is now. And I think it's a good thing. Um, all, all persons did not think it was good. And so we had to bring some along screaming. But I think it's important for us to be, I always wanted to be ahead of the game. And um, learn that from Mr. Stewart. Um, and I think that anything that you can do to to make the public happy right. is what we do, and it's what we should be doing. And when we found that that the public was going to other areas to get their library service, it was definitely a time to to change. Mm -hmm. Because if we wanted to pull them in and make us a viable entity, we needed to be doing what others were doing. And uh, I, just, I think it's a good thing. One, one of the things we did that was sort of technological, but back when the Olympics were in Atlanta in 96, we had public access catalogs out on the floor already. And we pulled four of them on to the into the atrium and set them up for email, which was only sort of just beginning right. back yeah. then. <laughs> and so visitors from out of town could come in here and check their out of town email and they were amazed that little old Birmingham and the library actually yeah. had that service. Yeah. And I, I think it's indicative of the forward thinking that has always been a part of this institution. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it's it's been very interesting. And none of this has been under me. Uh, most of it was under Barbara. Um, but BPL is 
it was one of the first public library systems to have uh, system-wide internet access for the public. Uh, when electronic books were seen to be popular, uh, BPL and Jefferson County, as a system began uh, sending those out. And long before that, we had circulated audio books, which some public libraries fought that when they came out. Uh, but it has definitely, the technology has definitely changed the profession uh, and the requirements to be a good librarian. I could not be today in that field. I mean, I'm, I'm way behind that curve. Uh, and it's going to continue to change. It's, it's going to affect buildings. It's going to affect the materials that you buy. It's going to affect uh, maintenance and, and capital costs. You know, you used to buy a typewriter and expect it to last 20 or 25 years. Uh, Today you buy a computer or you often lease it because you know it's going to be out of date very quickly. It's going to be broken from it. And all of that has real budgetary implications. And I will say that the city of Birmingham, like virtually every city I have ever heard of, I've talked to a lot of library directors over the years and they all have the same complaint. Their cities are, are very happy if they've got the money to build things. But they do not want to maintain them. They do not want to repair them. They do not want to replace things that people don't see as big projects. And that's that's a real problem, and it's going to become worse. And you know, to me, that makes absolutely no financial sense because it would be so much easier to budget on an annual basis for right. routine repair, right. maintenance, replacement. Right. Than to worry about the huge capital outlay. You've got to make them sometimes, but yeah. it's like mm -hmm. it, it just, the thought process is just not there. Maybe one day they'll catch up. I know. What I was going to say, what I would have hope do is to do a maintenance report, an ongoing maintenance report. That we constantly sent to the city mm -hmm. about you know this is what we'll need in two years this is what we'll need in three years i mean it was never really listened to but no we continued to send it right and they're dealing um, with it even now yeah. you know in, in my end of the world things have a finite life roofs leak air conditioners break furnaces break and you know how long they're going to last and you know how much they mm -hmm. cost and so, if you take care of them, they last a little longer. And at any and at any point when they were going to do a, a bond, yeah, we always it, we we had our stuff already ready. ready. We had a list ready to send you. Yeah. Know, these, these are the things we, that we need. Yeah. You know, we, we never had a problem in supplying a very very quickly a list of capital <laughs> projects because we kept one going. Right. Uh, and as a part of the budget, which is what y'all taught us to do, you just send it in every year. Yeah. And they couldn't say they it didn't, didn't matter that, that it didn't happen. A lot of the budget, half the budget was sent in every year. I remember when I was at Smithfield, every year, you know, we sent in a, a plan for a budget for the new Smithfield Library. Yeah. And every year I expected it to be, you know, some new branch heads. So I, was, I expected it to be funded. And, and every year it was, I was, one year we were so sure until I started boxing up books. Yeah. And then it was not. And then I, I told Ginger then, I said, never again will I box anything until mm -hmm. I know that the money is there. And a couple of years later, we got it. But it just took yeah. a lot of time. Well, when you but had you not sent it in. When you do that, you know, when, when the city or one of your funding agencies, you know, if, if your employer or whatever, when they finally do have some money, and you have requested the same thing five years ago, it's very difficult for them to argue and say, well, you really don't need that. Right. Now, people that submit one thing this year, well, they didn't pass that, so I'll try something else next year. And they keep going like that. Well, when the money's there, they'll say, well, these people really don't know what they need. So we never got everything we asked for, but we always got something we asked for. It was funny with capital budgets. The only thing you needed to do was update the prices. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> was never a lot of work for us. So. <laughs> Unless there was something new on the horizon that you had. <laughs> you know, you asked about technology and how it's changed. 
it has changed the way we deliver services and in some cases i think it has changed the services obviously it's changed sure. them. but i don't think it's changed the thought processes behind the service yeah. Yeah. and that to me is the bedrock of the profession yeah mm -hmm. yeah um, that's true you, you got to do the same amount of thinking you got to do the same amount of interacting you got to do the same amount of budgeting and then figuring out how to do more with less, um, that does not change. And where we are now started oh so long ago with the foundation laid by Fant and by Richardina and by George and Jack and Barbara and up to Lee right now, it's all been in many ways a very logical process mm -hmm. there have been skips there have been bumps mm -hmm. and there always will be right. but there's a pretty rock solid basis yeah. and well that that's what drove me as a director and i knew what had happened before and it was up to me i felt to continue, to continue it and to, to build upon it mm -hmm. and i didn't want to go that so that was the driving force in my head you know to make sure that we keep what we have and we build upon that and move forward yeah. in whatever area that was and we had like i hope said we had a really good foundation of people and um work that was laid out and, and you had a path you had a path to follow you didn't path. have to yeah, yeah. you didn't have to make it up have we given you enough to edit? I think so. Thank you guys very much. Thank you for asking. It's kind of fun. That's fine. <laughs>